there were instructions in writing issued to all the state governments that whenever photographs of a chief minister are published anywhere the photograph of the prime minister should also be there and the prime minister's photo should be at least 50% bigger than the photo of the chief minister everything was revolving around modi 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 on the vaccine certificates on ration bags everywhere modi's photo was put up very very well organized tens of thousands of crores were spent by the government on just propagating this face and this name and this personality cult we need to understand the context in which this election took place so we need to see what was really happening uh, in this country uh, in the last 5 or 10 years and what was really happening was uh, that there was a brutal assault on every value that is enunciated in our constitution in our democracy there was an assault on fundamental rights all fundamental rights including the right to liberty the right to speech the right to equality large numbers of people across the country were arrested and put in jails usually on false charges such as some some of our finest human rights activists were jailed and many of them are still languishing in jail in the bhima koregaon case in the delhi riots cases and on various charges of sedition or under the unlawful these various draconian laws like the unlawful activities prevention act or the prevention of money laundering act or the national security act etc there was an assault on speech and the assault took two forms one was the strangulation of the mainstream media and the control of the mainstream media and it was made an instrument of propaganda and hate by the ruling party by the bjp and the other was to prevent other people from speaking out against the government or saying things which were not liked by the government many of them were arrested their social media accounts were taken down on the orders of the government so all these things have been happening there is an assault on equality of course there is a assault on all minorities in the country on the streets on the social media and indeed by some laws which were brought in as well we saw we have been seeing public lynchings of particularly members of the muslim community breaking of churches vandalizing of churches across the country and especially in manipur we have been seeing uh absolutely false and defamatory allegations being made against muslims of this country particularly against muslims and also against other minorities and we also saw the citizenship amendment act which was brought in which was a clearly discriminatory law discriminating against muslims in particular there was a wholesale assault on all the institutions all the democratic institutions of this country assault meaning there was an attempt to control them and make them an instrument of the ruling party that assault extended of course to the media also to the judiciary also to the election commission also to parliament also to all the investigative agencies including enforcement directorate cbi income tax nia all these investigative institutions were essentially made an instrument a political instrument of the ruling party to harass and intimidate those that the ruling party did not like whether they were opposition politicians whether they were activists whether they were journalists they were <coughs> 
an assault on the independence of the election commission by appointing totally compromised and uh, people who were under the control of the government. For a long time in this country, after <coughs> TN session, the election commission remained an independent institution to conduct free and fair elections in India. But in the last six, seven years, we have seen that the independence of the election commission has been thoroughly compromised and it has essentially become an instrumentality of the BJP. Even the controller and auditor general. There was a time when the controller and auditor general was regarded as a very independent institution auditing and exposing the corruption in all departments of the government. But now we are seeing in the last few years that the controller and auditor general has virtually stopped doing most of the audits of public finances that it was doing and it is functioning largely at the behest of the government. The best example of that was in the Rafael deal where the, before the CAD's report came out, the government gave a note in a sealed envelope to the Supreme Court saying that the CAG has audited this Rafael deal, the audit has found nothing wrong with it, this audit report has been also placed in the parliament. Now all this was false and they further said that in this audit the pricing details of these aircrafts has been removed. Now firstly it was totally false, the audit had not been done. How did the government know that the pricing details of the Rafael audit would not be there in the audit? Obviously, the government had instructed the CAG not to put pricing details in the audit. That was a clear example of how the CAG was functioning at the behest of the government and not independently. See, the CAG, like uh, uh, the election commission, over the years had become despite the fact that both the CAG and the Election Commission were being appointed by the government, but it had developed uh, an institutional independence which was quite robust. But in the last few years that those institutions have also, the independence of those institutions has also been destroyed. Similarly, the National Human Rights Commission and these kind of agencies were also completely compromised and brought under the control of the government. The gentleman who heads the National Human Rights Commission currently one is one Justice Arun Mishra, whose only claim to fame, or he has several claims to fame actually. One of them is that uh, he gave a benefit of more than 20,000 crores to Adani and sometimes during vacations in totally illegal hearings. The other claim to fame is that uh, he dismissed that Birla Sahara uh, case in which we had sought an independent investigation into the documents recovered by the CBI from the offices of Birla and Sahara which showed that Modi had been paid 40 crores by the Sahara companies and 25 crores by the Birla company. He dismissed it by saying that no, no, these are loose papers. Nothing, no investigation can be ordered on the basis of loose papers. He did not give a single judgment in his entire career in the Supreme Court against the government. And there are any number of judgments that he gave in favor of the government. His first act after becoming chairman of the National Human Rights Commission was to hold a seminar on how human rights organizations are working against human rights. That's the National Human Rights Commission for you, <clears throat> the, what it has been reduced to. And the same thing has been happening to various other institutions, including educational institutions like the UGC, the NCERT, the, this NTC, this uh, NTA, which conducts these educational examinations and the universities. In virtually all the universities controlled by the central government, vice chancellors who have been appointed are all RSS people, almost all RSS people. They are people who have no understanding of education. The current chairman of the UGC who was earlier uh, the vice chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University, he said 
that we have to put tanks and aircrafts in the campus of JNU in order to instill nationalism among the students. He stopped, he stopped debates, discussions, seminars, etc. on the campuses of JNU. These are the kind of vice chancellors who have been put in these universities. <clears throat> there was organized propagation of hate and falsehood by this government. And through the media, mainstream media which they controlled, there was a very, very well thought out and conscious attempt to create a personality cult around Modi. There were instructions in writing issued to all the state governments that whenever photographs of a chief minister are published anywhere, the photograph of the prime minister should also be there and the prime minister's photo should be at least 50% bigger than the photo of the chief minister. Everything was revolving around Modi, Modi, Modi on the vaccine certificates, on ration bags, everywhere Modi's photo was put up. Very, very well organized. Tens of thousands of crores were spent by the government on just propagating this face and this name and this personality cult. <clears throat> there was an assault on the constitution and we know that if the BJP had won, then there were several ministers who had gone on record to say that we will change the constitution, we will convert India into a Hindu Rat. And there was an assault on civility itself by means of having a destruction of the rule of law, public lynchings on the streets, promotion of lawlessness and violence, promotion of bulldozers to bulldoze homes of people that the government did not like, particularly minorities, by just making some false accusation against them without that accusation being proved in any court of law and thereafter going and bulldozing their homes. It's a double illegality. Firstly, you have not proved whether that person has committed any offence. Secondly, even if you have proved that, you cannot bulldoze their homes. That is totally against the law. You can punish them in accordance with law. You can't bulldoze their homes. People who spoke against the government were being vilified on the social media. They were being abused. If they were women, they were being threatened with rape. People were being threatened with murder and so on. And this whole troll army which the BJP set up on the social media was controlled by Mr. Modi himself as disclosed and exposed by this uh, journalist Swati Chaturvedi in her book, I am a troll, that this whole troll army that the BJP had, whose job was only to abuse, threaten and vilify people, spread hate, spread fake news, etc., that this whole troll army was controlled by Mr. Modi himself. So, this was the context in which this 24 election was fought. And the election was a totally unequal fight. On the one hand, we had this party which controlled almost all the money in the electoral bonds also. They collected more than 50% of the money, just one party, and the remaining 50% went to other political parties. But more than that, they, they used all government money as well as uh, uh, all the instrumentalities of the government for their election propaganda. The election commission was under their control and it was behaving in a totally partisan manner, not preventing gross violations of the model code of conduct by the government and allowing and uh, stopping the opposition leaders occasionally from even doing legitimate things. The <coughs> accounts of many opposition parties were frozen by the government so as to deprive them even of the small or little funds that they had. Therefore, the opposition fought this election with their hands tied behind, behind their backs. <coughs> and the judiciary, unfortunately, was turning a blind eye to all this. There were speakers who were behaving this in Maharashtra, the symbol of the uh, of the Shiv Sena was given to this 
Shinde. I mean, who is a <laughs> nobody? He was just picked up by the BJP and he brought a few MLAs along with him and therefore they were able to break the uh, the opposition government and form a BJP uh, Shiv Sena government. And this fellow was recognized as the real Shiv Sena despite the fact that he had very little support within the party. And yet the Supreme Court did nothing. And we were seeing this repeatedly that there is this bulldozers going on everywhere. This is a bulldozing of the rule of law in this country. But the Supreme Court was doing nothing. And today there is this sort of large scale mischief going on in this country of various people in various parts of the country saying that this mosque is built over the remains of a temple 400 years ago. And this is an inquiry into this or any suit for reclaiming that mosque is prohibited by the Places of Worship Act and yet this mischief is being allowed to go on and it is going on even despite in the full gaze of the Supreme Court. <coughs> Yesterday or two, three days ago, the UP government has issued orders that on this Kavad Yatra route, the uh, vendors have to put up their names so that people can know whether they are Hindu or Muslim, etc. Totally illegal order. They have no authority in law to pass such an order. But unfortunately, out of fear, the vendors are complying, all these street vendors and other shop owners, etc. And the whole object of this is to create further communal polarization, to isolate and boycott the Muslim vendors and perhaps to even wreak mob violence on these Muslim vendors. And all this is happening and unfortunately, I mean, there is, there is a complete trampling of our constitutional values and rule of law going on in this country, but unfortunately the Supreme Court has largely turned a blind eye to all this, which is very, very unfortunate. But thank God for the alternate media. Despite so many uh, disadvantages that the opposition had in this election, the one advantage that they had was that the alternate media had come up, an alternate media had come up on the internet. And this was print as well as YouTube visual media. And fortunately for us, in the last few years, the whole digital revolution and the communication revolution and the IT revolution has created a situation where the majority of the people in this country have a smartphone. Now, <clears throat> most people now no longer watch news on television, because also because these television uh, media houses are totally discredited, but also because they find it more convenient to watch on their smartphones. And in this situation, many good journalists who were fed up with the functioning of the mainstream media, which had been turned into instruments of hate and propaganda by this government, they came out and set up their own media organizations on the internet as well as YouTube channels. And fortunately for us, these altern this alternate media became not only very prominent, but in my view, more influential, more powerful than the mainstream media. And to a very large extent, the result of this election is due to this alternate media which came up. So this was one advantage. In fact, there is this woman who heads this ANI news service, which is a totally government-controlled Godi Media news service. Called her name is Smita Prakash, and she holds a podcast called Smita Prakash with four samosas. That's the title of her podcast. And there were these four idiots sitting with her, and they were discussing in one of the podcasts that look, uh, the alternate media, uh, the, the alternate media, if you look at the viewerships and the number of views of people on YouTube, you find that the first 27, the top 27 are all that side. She says that side, that side meaning in the opposition camp and against the BJP. And she says, our side 
comes only at item 28. So all the top 27 YouTube channels were, according to her, on the other side. So this was, this, this has been a very important development which has been very, very, very critical to achieving this election result and we should recognize that. The... <coughs> Huh? Subair. Huh, huh. Is he here? I don't, I don't think he's here. He lives in Bangalore, I know, huh? but actually I, he probably would not have known. Yes. But there are there are many such people, people on the social media, people on YouTube, people on Twitter, people on Facebook, people on though Facebook is a thoroughly compromised uh, 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 platform. It's totally, uh, to a very large extent, also controlled by the government. Uh, but at least YouTube and Twitter are, to a very large extent, still relatively free. Despite the continuous attempts of the government to control these also. And Zubair is one example of a person who has been using his uh, presence on, the, on Twitter to, to do a fantastic job of... Uh, giving you the right information, exposing fake news, uh, all kinds of things. So, so there are many, many, many such people. These are the real heroes of today who have, who have managed to change public opinion despite all this control over media, over money, over proper instruments of propaganda and uh, everything all the, over the election commission, etc. Despite all these advantages that the government had, to a very large extent, they were neutralized by this alternate media. <coughs> now, the election results. So, uh, <coughs> of course, as uh, was pointed out by uh, Mr. Uh, Pasha, the <coughs> election results are clearly a political defeat for the BJP and Mr. Modi. Uh, it was evident, firstly, that uh, instead of char so par, they were reduced to 240. Uh, it was evident from the faces of Mr. Modi. It is evident from the, their morale of the BJP and Mr. Modi today. And it is evident from the morale of the opposition also. Because you can see that after the elections, the BJP and Mr. Modi and all their supporters seem to be very dejected. Their morale is down, they are very crestfallen. But the morale of the opposition is up, as you could see in this parliament session when the opposition was speaking vis-a-vis -vis when the ruling party people were speaking. It was clear that the opposition views, both the ruling party and the opposition views this result as a defeat for the BJP and a victory for the opposition, despite the fact that the BJP is still in government. But the question is, was it a vote against the communal politics of the BJP? I would say that, uh, I would slightly differ with Mr. Pasha here. Despite the fact that the BJP lost Ayodhya, and they lost the majority of the seats in UP, which is their sort of stronghold. I do not think that it represents a very clear and decisive defeat of communal politics in this country. The defeat of the BJP was on account of several factors. Of course, one of the factors was that the uh, that the alternate media had come up and the alternate media was fortunately largely saying the right things and was largely against the BJP, the alternate media which had come up. It was also, I think one of the reasons for the BJP's defeat was the overexposure of Mr. Modi and this attempt to create a personality cult around Mr. Modi and have the whole election revolve around Modi was a counterproductive strategy and it backfired in multiple ways. I think the people were fed up of this kind of 
glorifying of one individual and creation of a personality cult and trying to make him into a demigod or even a god like Mr. Modi himself tried to do by saying that he is non-biological. But more than that, more than that, see it, it has angered, it has alienated, it has demoralized the second rung leadership of the BJP with the result that people like Vasundara Raje, who was the best bet for the BJP and the most uh, effective leader that they had in Rajasthan, she kind of took, decided to take a back seat in this election and so did many other people. Many other people, of course there are some people like Shivraj Singh who probably still tried their best to do whatever to make the BJP win, who are also second rung leaders who have been sidelined, who had been sidelined by Mr. Modi. But then there are some who have, who do not have that kind of self-respect that others have, Vasundara Raji had some self-respect and therefore she decided to take a back seat. There are others also who had some self-respect within the BJP who felt that, well, if everything is going to be around Modi and if we are going to be sidelined like this, why should we work so hard? So it that kind of backfired. And as Yogendra Yadav has pointed out, that in this election, this election, many of the real issues came to the fore, apart from communal politics. So in the 2014 and 2019 elections, to a very large extent, communal politics was at the forefront. But this time he feels that communal politics was relegated to the background and many real issues like inflation or employment or other problems that people were facing, corruption, etc., that came to the fore. For example, in Ayodhya, I feel one of the reasons for the response for the uh, defeat of the BJP was the corruption around the Ram temple. It was not so much a defeat of their communal politics or ideology, but people just didn't like this kind of corruption which took place and the displacement of a large number of poor people there. To some extent, I'm not saying that um, communal politics has not been defeated at all. To some extent, communal politics has been defeated, but it has not been defeated decisively. There are still a significant section of uh, our society which has been communalized during the 10 years of this BJP government. And that has not yet, I mean, some of them may have become normal and decommunalized also, but still, the number of people whose minds have been poisoned and who have been communalized in the last 10 years is still more than what they were, say, 10 years ago. Significantly more than what they were 10 years ago. <clears throat> now, we are seeing the results of uh, <coughs> a rejuvenated opposition versus a demoralized BJP. Now, we are seeing that there is a lot of infighting within the BJP, especially in UP, but also in other states. Uh, because they are realizing gradually this has sunk into the BJP cadre that Modi is no longer a vote getter and it is clear from all surveys and parameters that you can, uh, real parameter that today Rahul Gandhi is more popular in this country than Modi. There is very little doubt of that. So, <clears throat> so the BJP people are also realizing that Modi is no longer their trump card, far from being their trump card, they are also beginning to realize that he may even be have become a liability. And if he continues to lead the party, he will lead the party to ruin. And I believe that if elections were to be after the uh, elections, I mean after the 1st of June till today, we are now 45 days or 50 days after that, in the last 50 days, public opinion has further shifted significantly and if elections, I believe that if elections were to be held today, the BJP will not even get 150 seats. That's my uh, assessment. And we will see evidence of this in the coming assembly elections in these three states of Maharashtra, 
Jharkhand and Haryana where I feel, I believe that the BJP is going to lose all the three states. Now this, <coughs> despite all this, this government, the Modi government, the Modi 3.0 as it is called, it is still practicing the same kind of model as they were doing earlier. The same abuse and misuse of investigative agencies against opposition leaders, the same kind of communal, divisive, hateful and violent politics, the same use of bulldozers, etc. In fact, they are seeking to all, almost double down on the kind of politics that they did earlier. But Despite their doing that, I think, and in fact, because of their doing that, the public opinion is again, is still further shifting away from them. And <clears throat> that is also evident. See, public opinion plays a very, very important role and impacts the functioning of many institutions, including the media and the judiciary. So we are seeing that because of the shift of public opinion away from the BJP, some sections of this mainstream media which had become completely under the control of this government is now beginning to get up and say some things against the government and become a little more independent. We are also seeing some evidence of this in the judiciary. The judiciary which had kind of almost whose independence had virtually collapsed during this uh, time. I'll come to why the independence of the judiciary collapsed. See, there are four reasons for the collapse of the independence of the judici ju judiciary. The first is that when there is a strong fascist government, a lot of judges who are not very strong and robust internally, they kind of get fearful and this happened during the emergency also with the Supreme Court in that habeas corpus judgment. And this also happened during these last 10 years when they saw that this was a totally fascist government who could get away and do anything. So many judges kind of became fearful and were afraid to give any decisions to stand up to the government and give any decisions against the government. This was the first reason. Second reason is, that this government has adopted a policy and a method of preventing the appointment of independent judges, especially judges from the minority communities. So even when the collegium, today the selection is done by the collegium of senior judges of the Supreme Court, but and the law is that the government can return the name once if they don't like a name with reasons, and thereafter if the collegium unanimously reiterates, they have to appoint these people. But we have seen in the last 10 years, there are literally dozens of cases of judges from the minority communities or independent judges being recommended by the Collegium, but not appointed, unanimously reiterated by the Collegium, but not appointed by the government. And the result of this is that now the Collegium has adopted or Chief Justices have adopted a strategy of saying, all right, we will appoint 50% judges according to what you want and 50% we will select ourselves. So they are kind of ceding their authority of selecting judges to some extent to the government. So this is another reason why we are seeing many judges of the high courts who are communal, many judges who are completely oblivious of what the constitution and the law is. <coughs> Those kind of judges have come into the courts and there are fewer independent judges being appointed. Then the third reason is post-retirement jobs. The lure of post-retirement jobs continues to influence the independence of judges. So you have Ranjan Gogoi who gave the Rafael judgment, absurd judgment, uh, who gave the Ayodhya judgment. He was made a member of the Raj Sabha. Then you have some people who were made governors. Then, then you have some people who were made chairmen of various commissions and tribunals, like this Arun Mishra was made chairman of NHRC, and this fellow Khan, Khan Wilkar, who gave several horrible judgments. 
just prior to his retirement, including ordering the prosecution of Tista Setalwad, ordering the prosecution of Himanshu Kumar uh, in that Chhattisgarh fake encounters case, and on this PMLA, etc. That man has been appointed uh, Lokpal. So, uh, this post-retirement jobs, of course, this problem was there even prior to the Modi regime, but it continues today. And it has been used very effectively by the Modi government to influence the functioning of judges uh, by giving them, hanging this carrot before them of a post cushy post-retirement job. And then the last, and this is the most sinister reason by which the government has influenced the judiciary, is that this government has adopted a practice of preparing dossiers, of getting all the agencies, particularly intelligence agencies, to prepare dossiers on all the judges. So in those dossiers, they write down whether the judge has done anything wrong on which he can be blackmailed, whether his children have done anything wrong on which he can be blackmailed, and then they use that information to blackmail those judges. And if you happen to get something on the Chief Justice, then you have control of more than half the judiciary because the Chief Justice, apart from other things, has this important job of deciding which case is to be listed before which bench, which means he can virtually decide the fate of any case by choosing an appropriate bench. So, <clears throat> Uh, I feel that this election results will have and is already uh, having an impact on the judiciary also that we will see that some of these judges will become more independent than they were in the last 10 years. Uh, we are seeing some evidence of that and the reason is that they now do not see such a strong fascist government staring them in their face. They see that this is a weaker government and <clears throat> will not be able to... So we will see some pushback. We Hopefully we will see some pushback by this collegium and by the Supreme Court even on appointments. Till now they had begun to defer to the government and say that all right, you appoint 50%, you select 50%, we will select the remaining 50%. But now I feel that there may be some pushback, maybe. <clears throat> now the last question is, so where do we go from here? What do we need to do? What does civil society need to do? So there are several short term and of course many long term challenges before us. Uh, the short term problems are that we are still seeing this communal hate and lynchings and all this kind of uh, orders being issued by th this recent order by the UP government that all vendors along the Kamar youth have to, uh, Kamar route have to display their names and so on. So we have to, we have to confront this problem of uh, communalism and hate and fake news, falsehoods that are being spread in order to demonize people from the Muslim community. This is a continuing problem and a huge challenge for us and we have to confront it as civil society. And of course, uh, one of the things that is uh, happening is that these um, social media users like uh, Zubair or Ravish Kumar who's on YouTube, they are doing a great job in debunking fake news or propagating the right kind of things or uh, uh, to campaign against this communal hate, etc. And we need, as civil society members, we also need to pitch in. So all of us, whoever, uh, we all need to keep track of what is happening. We need to raise our voices against all this collectively if possible, individually if it is not possible, collectively. And we need to uh, provide these YouTubers, etc., the material. Those of us who can be effective YouTubers or those of us who can be effective social media users should also become effective social media users and YouTubers on these issues. Those of us who can't be should at least be able to provide the, current, uh, the right kind of material to these YouTubers like Ravish, etc., so that they can 
propagate that. Yogendra Yadav had once said that one of the jobs of civil society is to create a truth army as opposed to the troll army of the BJP. So an army of people who are, BJP has a troll army of paid people. We can create a truth army of unpaid volunteers who are just civil society activists who organize themselves to spread to debunk fake news, to spread the right kind of news, to spread positive news, to spread news about the positive impacts of uh, diverse society, of communal harmony, etc. That's one thing. Secondly, I have been saying this, that in order to confront communalism, we need to create communal harmony councils in at least every district in every major city. These should consist of senior and respected people from different communities and their job should be firstly to organize functions and programs where members, especially influential members of different communities are able to come together and interact with each other. This helps a great deal in destroying this sort of hate and uh, prejudice that has been created in society by this kind of fake news and uh, falsehoods and propaganda that has been going on by the BJP. So this is one thing. Secondly, they should underline uh, and immediately alert the authorities and uh, show wherever these kind of communal incidents, lynchings, uh, fake news, hatred are taking place. And thirdly, we should actually have a small group of lawyers in every district who take up this job of pursuing the people who are propagating hate because these are crimes under our laws and our constitution. Communal, propagating communal hatred is a crime, is a serious crime and therefore people should register FIRs and pursue it in court, etc. against these people. So this is one thing that we need to do. This is an immediate challenge of confronting hate and prejudice and then <clears throat> Uh, I mean, we have a very sort of mammoth task ahead of us of repairing these institutions which have been destroyed, damaged and controlled by the BJP whose independence has been destroyed. We have to do many things. We have to, of course, raise our voices uh, regarding the functioning of these institutions. We have to sometimes go to court. We have gone to court, for example, regarding the appointment of the election commission and the CAG, etc. Those cases are still pending in court. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so there is a lot of work that needs to be done to repair these institutions. It's not going to be easy. It will take some time. Uh, we have to uh, <clears throat> we have to deal with the judiciary also as I have always said, that one of the ways in which civil society can have a positive influence on the judiciary is that we criticize all the wrong judgments which come and we, uh, we praise all the good judgments that come out of the judiciary. That helps to, uh, to strengthen those judges who give independent judgments and helps to demoralize those who give the wrong kind of judgments which are against the constitution. And there is a larger challenge actually of reclaiming our democracy because you see over the years our whole electoral democracy has become largely a money game. So those and the reason is that we have first passed the post in our election system at two levels. First when we elect our candidate, the candidate who gets the highest number of votes becomes the elected candidate and the other people who may have together got even 70% of the votes, they count for nothing. Then when the government is formed, the party which has 51% of the MPs or MLAs forms the government and the opposition counts for nothing in the government. The result is that when people go to vote, they are conscious of this fact that only one candidate will be elected and only one party will form the government. One party or one coalition will form the government. So they don't want to waste their vote. So they will not vote for the party or the candidate that they consider to be the best if they feel that their best candidate or the best party has no chance of coming to power, has no chance of winning. Then they won't vote for him. Then they will search for 
the less bad among the two parties or two candidates that they feel have some chance of winning. And how do they judge who has some chance of winning? That judgment is formed on the basis of the visibility of the candidates and the political parties. And visibility is a function of largely of money. Because you can buy visibility by having advertisements on TV, on newspaper. You can put up large hoardings. You can have paid workers distributing your handbills, your posters and so on. You can have uh, even large political rallies on the ba by spending money by saying, okay, all right, I will pay say 50,000 per bus load of people or whatever. If you bring 100 bus loads, I'll pay you 50 lakhs. This is how even the BJP's rallies are organized and many other rallies are also organized. So elections have become a game of money largely. Of course, this time, despite the BJP having the bulk of the money, they did not win. And this was in that respect an unusual election. But otherwise, this is a huge challenge for our democracy. Ki how do we rescue our electoral democracy from the influence of money? And I feel that for that, we need to decentralize power. Uh, we need to have power uh, going down to the grassroots level uh, and not uh, controlled or largely. So today, we have a top-down system where at the top, the central government wields 90% of the power. The state governments wield the remaining 9% of the power and only 1% power is with the local body. We have to reverse this. We have to have most power with the local body, then lesser power with the state governments, then lesser power with the central government. So this is a huge challenge for which we will have to wage a very long uh, battle. It's a long-term challenge for us. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we need to have proportional representation even in this electoral democracy. We need to have proportional representation so that a party getting 2% vote gets at least 2% MPs or MLAs. Today, a party getting 2% vote gets zero. So they, they, therefore, they are then at least people will vote for the party that they like most. They will know that at least 5-10 people of this party will also get elected even if they get only 2-3% vote. And they will actually get more vote because uh, they, when people know that parties will get the number of seats according to the percentage of votes, more people will vote for these sort of not the two largest parties, so to say. So that also will, and we need to have public funding for elections. We need to control election expenditure in a more uh, effective manner. Today, there are candidates who are spending 100 crores for their election, even though the limit is less than 1 crore, but we have... There are political parties. BJP had, for example, 16,000 crores officially in their accounts in the last five years. Now, 16,000 crores means if they put up, say, 500 candidates in the Lok Sabha election, maximum they can spend 500 crores for these 500 candidates. But if they have 16,000 crores, then the limit of one crore per candidate means nothing. If the party is spending 30 times or 40 times that money, as the limit on each candidate, then this limit means nothing. We have to put a limit on party spending. We have to ensure that these limits get enforced. So when this note bandi was brought, Modi said that we want a cashless economy. Now, I can understand that ordinary people cannot be made cashless because they need, they can't do every transaction through banks. But at least political parties and candidates can be made cashless by having a law which says, that uh, political parties and candidates will only spend through bank transactions, will only take money through bank transactions. That would put some break on this cash spending which people are doing and virtually making a mockery of this limit on election expenses. So we need to have some measures which will effectively control the spending and we need to have public funding of elections. You see, it's very easy to have a law which says that every candidate will be given, say, 50 rupees per vote after the election. So if a candidate gets 1 lakh votes, he will get 50 lakh rupees by the government. Now, so 
today we have a situation where there are candidates who do not even have that one crore to spend for their elections or whatever 75 lakhs for their elections so that way at least they can borrow some money from their friends and relatives and thereafter repay them if they get 1 lakh 1.5 lakh votes they will be given that much money and they can repay them that will level the playing field a little more those who say that no no this is too expensive this is not practical they don't realize what they are talking about if you pay 50 rupees per vote in one election for example in this election the total number of votes cast were about 60 crores so if you have 60 crores into 50 that is 3000 crores 3000 crores for the government to pay by way of public funding of elections in one election is nothing they are spending much 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 more than that for every election so therefore public funding can easily be done proportional representation can easily be brought it is there in most countries you can bring measures to effectively plug the loopholes of overspending by candidates you can put limits on spending by political parties that way even our electoral democracy will become a little more fair a little more robust but of course decentralization of power has to be done so therefore we as civil society have to work on a number of fronts there are many reforms required in institutions including the judiciary etc but it is the job of civil society to form campaigns movements and ask for these reforms it is only when civil society puts pressure on the establishment on the government on parliament etc that these reforms will come otherwise those who are in power are never interested in any reforms are usually not interested in any reforms so thank you very much mattashtu vishesha video galannu nodalu mattu hosa video gala bagge tiliyalu idina.com youtube channel subscribe maadi mattu bell icon click maadi